kind of surfy out there, right? <laughs> 50 foot waves on the North Shore. I saw a photo posted of waves breaking over Mokumanu. You know where that is? Outside of Kaneohe Bay. Nobody's ever seen waves break over Mokumanu in memory. Anyway, so we're going to postpone the field trip. Uh, the, the trail on the west side that we intended to take to Kaena Point is closed uh, because of the waves. Uh, we heard that Camp Mokalea on the North Shore is closed because it got inundated, beat up by the waves. So probably not a good weekend to go up there. I'm sure the albatross are fine and the monk seals and everything else. But So um, Sunday, March 6th, and you heard that we have a bus, right? We're going to be driving up in style. It's free. <laughs> but if you'd like to go, you have to come and sign up with me. And you have to give me five bucks for you and everyone in your party. When you show up for me, I will give you the five bucks back. But if you don't show up for the field trip, guess what? No, go to the bus driver. <laughs> okay? So come and see me. Bring me five bucks. Um, you can bring friends, family, <coughs> kids, parents, significant others, and yourself. Okay? So it'll be a really nice bus ride. So much easier that way. And that you can bring tons of water. That would be the secret. Okay. I'd like to the question. If you if you decide that you want to go at the last minute and you don't give you five dollars, can you still show up and take the chances that I there's would. space on the bus? I would. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you should, and you should come. We're going to leave here at 9, right? Leave at um, the bus pulled out over by uh, Bachman Hall at 9 o'clock on Sunday the 6th. Put your hand up if you think you're going to come. Um, I'm still thinking about it. Yay. I'll loan you five bucks if you need it. <laughs> you still have to. And then I'll give it back to me. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yes. Uh, is the um, return trip at a set time? Oh, we'll be back here by 4. Oh, oh, okay. And the best Great. part, we still have Dr. Scott Roland, Roland to go with us, and he is such a fun geologist. He knows <coughs> everything about geology, and he's going to accompany us on the field trip. Yeah. Sorry, you said it's nine o'clock. Nine o'clock, Bachman. Okay. Pull out. You know where the buses pull out there. Okay. You'll see the the big bus. It's a bluebird bus. <laughs> Anybody else? If you have any questions, pull us over in um, recitation today. Okay, Dr. Benton Payne uh, did his dissertation on dry forest conservation and ecological restoration of an ethnobotanical resource in Kaupulehu, uh, North Kona, Hawaii. Uh, he also got his, oh, from, at here, University of Hawaii in Botany. He also got his Master's of Science here in Botany and his Bachelor's at UC Santa Barbara. Now he's with Partners for Fish and Wildlife Coordinator at US, sorry, US Fish and Wildlife Service, Honolulu. He's been there for, wow, 15, 16, almost 17 years now. That's impossible. Um, he has a huge knowledge of Hawaiian culture and biology that he will share with us today. Thank you. Um, so I, I do work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and if you go out to Ketna Point, you'll see the very first predator-proof fence ever built in the United States, and we helped um, build it, uh, a couple million dollars to build. Pred predator-proof fence means that it won't let any cats, mongoose, rats, of course, dogs, pigs, deer, um, into the area. So we protected it because it's important habitat for seabirds, especially the, the Laysan albatross <coughs> and the shearwaters. Um, there's special gates to go through, so there's double gates, so if you go into one gate, that first gate should close before the next gate opens. Again, ensuring that nothing will crawl with you to go get into that preserved area. Um, it's a very great area. It, it's got a unique lip at the top, curved lip, so if cats were to climb up the fence, they cannot go over this, this lip. So it's a particular patent that um, the New Zealanders um, developed in, in New Zealand, and that's, that's who we brought the, <coughs> the fence material from. So I encourage you to go out there. It's a very good, um, place to see seabirds, monk seals, turtles, and then during the winter time, um, uh, whales. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to go, go there. Um, happy to be here. I, I've been giving this lecture for um, a number of years now, and I'm happy to give it. It's going to focus uh, a little bit on island biology in the <coughs> beginning, 
and then we're going to go into ethnobotany, sort of the cultural uses of plants. And my my um, dissertation and master's was on the Hawaiian cultural uses of plants. So I'll be using some Hawaiian terms, which you may or may not be familiar with, um, and I'll be using some scientific terms, which hopefully you are familiar with being in this class. A general outline. Uh, we'll talk about who are the Hawaiians, where do they come from, what is this term called kino lau? I'll talk about that. Um, who are the four major Hawaiian gods? Uh, Hawaiian religion was polytheistic, so there are four major Hawaiian gods. These terms, hopefully if you don't know them by now, you will know them by um, your midterms and, and especially at the end of this course. I'll go over these terms again. This, this ethnobotanical term called folk taxonomy. Uh, how did the Hawaii, how were these uh, plants used to regulate society? I'll, I'll touch upon that as well. So we're in the middle of the Pacific, um, 2,500 miles or so from the west coast. It um, took uh, extraordinary means for plants and animals to get here. They couldn't just walk here on a land bridge, like in most continental areas. They had to come here either by the wind, by the water, um, or by birds. Uh, the islands were formed from a hot spot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, hot magma from the uh, uh, seabed comes up, breaks surface, forms an island. And we have a, uh, we have a, a Pacific plate that moves um, about a, a, a centimeter um, to the northwest, and as islands uh, break, break surface, they move to the northwest and another island forms. And so the oldest islands are, are to the west, northwest, the youngest is to the east, yes. So you say a centimeter, then what time frame? Year. Oh, a centimeter <coughs> a year? About the same amount as your, your, your fingernail. That's how much the Pacific plate moves. Okay, thank you. Um, the Hawaiians had a way of describing this sort of plate tectonics theory, and this through the uh, Mo'olelo, or story of Iacopolio Pele. This talks about Pele and her family traveling down the Hawaiian chain from the northwest to the east. Okay, so plate tectonics, <laughs> is from the east to the northwest. Pele is from the northwest to the southeast. So she came upon different islands looking for a home. She's looking for um, lava, an uh, area that's hot to, to live in. So she stopped off in Niihau, Kauai, Oahu, stuck her o'o in, in the ground, and, and water came up. So that wasn't a good place for her to, um, to reside. And she traveled down the island chain, and eventually ended up at um, Kilauea on the island of Hawaii. So again, the um, Hawaiian Islands, the old, youngest islands are here. Pele currently resides at Kilauea. The oldest islands in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands here, Midway and Kure, Kauai is here. So let's now look at this map sort of on its, on its side. So again, we have the youngest island, Hawaii here, and the Pacific Plate theory moves in this direction. So the youngest island here, the oldest islands, Nihau and Kauai, and farther to the northwest are the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And as the islands erode, we get seamounts. And these are islands that eroded underneath the ocean. So we have what's called the Emperor Seamounts. Far, farther northwest, those are aged around 70 million years ago. So these seamounts, at one time, were here 70 million years ago. But as the plate moves, the islands form and they erode, get smaller and smaller and smaller and get eventually subside back underneath the ocean. Okay, that's plate tectonics. You should know that already. Pele, the legend of Pele, the way the Hawaiians describe it is that she started here in Niihau, went to Kauai, again, only finding water, so she moved, came to Oahu, Molokai, Maui, no, no good home, eventually found Kilauea, and, and that's where she currently resides. So that's a Hawaiian way of describing uh, this evolution of islands, okay? The early Polynesians, um, based on archeology, span reached the Hawaiian Islands around 300 AD. They brought plants with them for subsistence. Um, so they needed to bring plants that which they knew they could live off of because they weren't sure where they were gonna go and if, if that area had the same type of plants. And again, the religion is based on four major gods. I'll go through those. So the archaeology shows us there are two phases of migration. So from uh, Western Polynesia, <coughs> the first migration was into the Society Islands at Tuamotu. And this area is going to be important um, in, in the next couple of slides. Then the second migration from this area, 
ventured out to Hawaii, to Rapa Nui, and to Aotearoa or New Zealand at the same time. And this is based upon carbon, radiocarbon dating. <coughs> two, two phase of migration of the Polynesians. They're all related by um, material culture, plants they use, the language they speak. Archaeology has reaffirmed this travel. Yeah, you know, I talked about the Society Islands and Tuamotu, so this area here. Well, in the Tuamotus was found an ad, and when it was um, dated and uh, uh, geo geophysic analysis uh, was done on it, this ad was made from rock that came from the island of Koho'olawe. Koho'olawe off the island of Maui. So, Hawaiians were traveling between Hawaii, or Polynesians were traveling between the Hawaiian Islands and the Tuamotus based upon you know, this it adds, adds more um, credibility to, to the, the stories that the Polynesians have about these, these vibrations. Again, uh, in the Tuamotus, a relic of a, a Maori canoe was found in the Tuamotus. So, uh, French Polynesia, there's travel obviously between here because parts of the canoe from Aotearoa were found in, in the Tuamotus also, Carolina. That's, that's archaeology. So four major gods go, go down into Hawaiian culture. We have God Kane, Ku, Lono, and Kanaloa, okay, four major gods. So these major gods manifest themselves in the plants. And there's certain plants dedicated to different gods. Um, these many plant forms of these gods is called, is, is it another Hawaiian term called kinolau. So um, the, the gods are embodied in the plants. They have certain kinolau within those plants. Um, these major gods also regulated uh, what you could eat, when you could eat, and who you could eat with. Men and women generally didn't eat with one another because of the, uh, the foods and the gods they represented. It also regulated when you could fish, when you could plant, and when you could harvest. So these four major gods also regulated society based upon uh, when you could harvest the fish. It also designated certain times of year when there was no war, and when certain times of year when you could have war. So the major gods regulate society. So some of the um, examples of uh, Kane are he is the creator of life, and gives life. He's associated with the dawn, the sun, and the sky. And he's also associated with freshwater, healing, and canoe building. The plants he's associated with are the sugarcane, the bamboo. There's a there's a city um, on the windward side called Kane Ohe. Hawaiian name of bamboo is Ohe. So that's one way you can re remember the Kinolau of Kane, one way of Kinolau. He's also uh, found in the tea plant, and of course the taro plant, and we'll, we'll discuss the taro plant in more in depth later. Okay, Kane. Ku, he's a god of war, of politics, fishing, bird catching, and also of canoe building. He's embodied in, in uh, different forest plants, like the ie ie and the ohilehua, the coconut, red fruit, and uh, another forest plant, the lolu, or fan palm. Lono, he's a god of peace and fertility. He's also a god of agriculture, sports, and medicinal herbs. So some of the plants that he's embodied in are kukui, the tree fern called hapu'u, the ipu, or gourd, the sweet potato, and also um, the animal of the pua'a, or pig, it is Lono. Kamapua'a is a demigod. Pick up, pick up, half man, half pig. Kanaloa. He's got the deep ocean, fishing, voyaging, and also healing. So his kinolau can are, are the um, octopus and banana. So again, kinolau are plants or animals which embody the spirit of certain Hawaiian gods. So the gods are embodied within those plants, like Kane and, and the power plant, um, sweet potato, and mono, 
coconut and cool and ferns and the goddess Laka, the Hula goddess Laka. You know, an example of, of a Kimura. Okay? Um, Hawaiian religion was also, uh, also regulated society through prohibitions called kapu. So this regulated um, who you can eat with, again, separation of men and women. Um, there were agricultural temples um, that were dedicated to uh, Lono and also were used to pray for a good harvest. And there was a time of the year for peace called the Makahiki. And it occurred generally during the winter time. Um, and it's the time of, uh, again, Lono. There's no war and no farming during this particular time of the year. Okay? So the, the Ku gods, the gods uh, associated with war, um, were usually covered or put away because there's no war. Um, Lono, um, this is the time to, to uh, praise Lono and good harvest and agriculture and of course also peace. Okay. Um, this is a, a recent picture of a, a, the Makahiki ceremonies that still take place today in various parts of the island. Um, this is from uh, Makua Valley and, uh, <coughs> access of Makahiki during a couple of years ago. So let's talk about um, how natural resources were managed. Um, Hawaiians lived in a land division called Ahu Pua'a. Um, and this is a land division that usually went from the summit of the mountain down to the coast, where you can do some shoreline fishing, and usually included a stream. Um, Hanalei Valley, from which this photo was taken, is a good example of an Ahu Pua'a. So the forests here provided wood, fiber, some clothing. Um, agriculture would have taken place in the, uh, the lowlands, um, taro, sweet potato, bananas, and of course then the ocean would, would have provided um, a bounty of um, a marine life to, to uh, gather. Another example of Aupua is, is here in Kaneohe, Te'eya, fish pond, the Makai portion, the ocean portion, where, where they actually uh, farmed fish and still be done today. Uh, the lowland area, this is a wetland, which was used traditionally for, for taro, taro, and, and um, now it's, it's, there, there is a uh, organization that's trying to revive the uh, harvesting, planting and harvesting of taro this area here, and then Malka um, were the forest, forest plants. Um, one of the take-home messages was that all forest, everything a Hawaiian needed to live was found within the Ahupua'a. So they, they resided in the Ahupua'a, there's trade between um, forest products and ocean products, and there's no real need for a Hawaiian to leave their Ahupua'a to go into another Ahupua'a, because everything they, they needed, food, medicine, um, was found within their aqua. Yeah, there's a question. So um, you said that fish, that fish pond is still being used today? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you can visit it, actually. They, there's a, a, a website um, for the fish pond. Um, Ahupua. Okay. Hawaiians believe that the, the land and the plants were more important, and it's up to them to take care of those, those plants, to take care of the land. It's found in the, the proverb, Let's um, now go into sort of the ethnobotanical portion of, of this talk. Um, remember I talked about plants that were brought on those early canoes? Um, these are plants that were brought by the Hawaiians. We call them Polynesian introductions. They weren't here in the islands when the Hawaiians came here. They were brought here by man. They were brought here by the early Polynesians. Examples are the taro, sweet potato, the banana, coconut, and bamboo. And I listed some of the, the <coughs> plant parts that were used um, for mainly for eating. And so you see the, the tubers of the sweet potato, the whole plant of the taro was actually uh, could be eaten. Um, so PI means Polynesian introduction in some of my slides. Stop by the Polynesian. Uh, taro, kalo, 
the entire plant is used. It's the underground corms which are cooked and then pounded to make the first stage is called pa'i'ai. And you can find pa'i'ai in, in Whole Foods. They, they sell it today. Um, that's the first stage of poi. When you add more water and you get more uh, a liquid um, uh, consistency, that becomes poi. And poi won't last very long. It may last about a, a week before it starts getting really rancid and sour. Some people like that. Um, Pa'i'ai, the first stage of, of pounding of the corn, actually can last a long time, you know, maybe weeks. So Pa'i'ai was the, the storage form of poi. And again, it's made from the corns of the tau. But the entire plant was eaten. The, the leaves um, were eaten. The, the stems were eaten. Um, Taro has something in it, though, called calcium oxalate crystals. And these crystals are found in the entire family of, of, of taro. Um, if you've heard of dumb cane, dumb cane is in the same family as, uh, as taro. Dumb cane and taro have these calcium oxalate crystals, so you need to cook the plant before you eat it. Otherwise, those crystals, small microscopic crystals, can get embedded in your hands, your skin, your throat, and cause you to suffocate. Some people suffocate. Some people get inflamed skin, so when they make lao lao, they have to wear gloves uh, because they're very sensitive to the calcium oxalate crystals. So make sure you cook the plant. And calcium oxalate is found throughout the whole plant. Um, Hawaiians had different um, names for different varieties of taro, and they were based upon the color of the pedio, the color of the leaf, um, the underside of the leaf. This, this naming convention of organizing um, sort of different names based upon these colorations or association with an area or association with an animal is called folk taxonomy. And this is the definition of folk taxonomy. It's the way sort of indigenous cultures categorize plants and animals. It's not scientific, but it's based upon um, features they're familiar with, each, either nature um, or their own um, uh, things that are important to their culture. So this website um, that I came across has many of the Hawaiian named varieties of taro. There are over 300 Hawaiian names of taro based upon coloration, taste, coloration of the leaves, coloration of the corn. You can find this website online. Um, and uh, Some of the examples are um, the variety elepayo. The spottedness is to resemble the spottedness of the elepayo bird. In Dennett Forest Bird. Apu white, Apu means cup, and this this cup, when it when it rains, water is collected in that cup. And so Apu Wai, the variety of Wai is to resemble a cup. Um, the Kumu is to resemble the fish Kumu, so the red reddishness. And then Puahia Pele, smoke of Pele, is to resemble the smoke found um, in hot lava. So again, folk taxonomy is the way Hawaiians use elements of nature to come up with names for these particular plants. It's found in, in, in all of the um, varieties of taro, varieties of sweet potato, varieties of banana. And you find this naming convention in, in all, all indigenous cultures. Even Western culture at a time, before the scientific method, when Linnaeus came around, you know, uh, Western culture used a, a form of folk taxonomy to name plants. <coughs> So other examples of uh, folk taxonomy found in the algae, marine algae, rat's foot al algae, or limo vava iole. Vava means foot, iole is rat, and these thalli are to resemble, uh, Hawaiians thought they resemble a rat's foot. Um, hulu hulu vaina, um, this is thought to resemble sort of hair, clumps of hair. So that's how it got its hulu hulu vaina. In back to taro, um, Taro can be grown in two main ways, dry land or wet land. Um, dry land still requires water, just not, it, it may not be permanently um, soaking in water like as it is in wet land. And then there's a style of wetland taro called pu'u pu'u where mounds of uh, mud are used to plant the taro and it's sort of easier to harvest the plant. Uh, this, this photo was taken at um, Kaniwai at the taro patch down here by the door. Let's go to sweet potato, Uala. Kinolao, Lono. Um, you look at the different leaf forms so, and colors. Again, 
Hawaiians had probably, uh, I think they had more than 100 named varieties of, of sweet potato. The, the pua, or the boar, with its ears and its snout, one of the ways uh, they, re they related the, the sweet potato with the boar is that the leaf sort of has the same type of um, uh, sort of symmetry with the two ears and the snout in general. So that's another way you could relate the, the pig and, and the sweet potato and lono is through this relationship of how it looks as far as you know, the facial feature of the, of the bull. Um, banana, uh, there are about 70 named varieties of banana. Um, interesting thing about banana is that it could be used in, in substitute for human sacrifice. There are three varieties that, that women could not eat. And they, those three varieties could be used um, in substitute for human sacrifice. So if there is no human around that could be used for human sacrifice, uh, one of these three varieties of banana could be used. That shows the importance of these three varieties um, in Hawaiian culture. Uh, coconut. Um, this also, the entire plant was used. The trunk was used to make um, uh, hula drums called pahu. The husk was used to make um, cordage called senet. It was used to bind the top of the pahu to the base or as a base for this uh, knee, knee drum. The shell of the coconut could be used for the smaller knee drum called um, um, puniu. Um, and of course the leaves could be thatched, used for thatching. So the entire plant was used. If you remember, coconut is is associated with the god Ku. So because of that, only men could handle products of, of, of coconut. So men made the senate, men made the pahu drums, men did, men did the thatching. Women were prohibited from doing that. Uh, bamboo. Bamboo has these long nodes. Bamboo is a type of grass. And so those nodes could be cut. They could be made into flutes or they can be made into hula implements. So bamboo is another Polynesian introduction. So now let's look at endemic plants. So endemic plants are plants that came here by natural means. They didn't come here by humans. They were here before the early Polynesians made to, to these islands. They came here either by wind, by birds, or on water. And they evolved here over millions of years be to become different species from where they originated from. So these are sort of what I call the true Hawaiians. They, they, they are only found in Hawaii. Endemic plants are only found in Hawaii, no place else in the world. And I'll go through some of these. Um, the kawila, the wood was used by the Hawaiians. Olona, cordage, koa was used for the kunus. Uh, Ohialehua was used for, um, a human, uh, for, for wooden images and also for hula. Um, Palapalai ferns were used for hula. So when the Hawaiians arrived at these islands, they brought with them certain plants that they could subsist off of, but they also ventured up into the uplands, and they tested plants, and they found that the Olona plant was good for cordage, actually provided some of the strongest um, fibers for, for them, and it was actually found to be one of the strongest fibers in the world at one time. Uh, they found koa wood to be a very good wood that could be used for making their canoes. Um, so you know, they, they weren't just um, uh, happy with what they brought. They ventured up and, and they found other plants that they could use and integrated that into their culture. There's another classification of plants that also came here by natural means. So they came here by, by the wind or by birds or by water. However, they did not evolve to become different from where they originated from. So we call these indigenous plants. They're still native. They're only found, they're found in Hawaii, but also found in other places, okay? Endemic is only found in Hawaii, indigenous found in Hawaii and elsewhere. So you'll find the Makaloa, the Aohuhu, many of our Limu in other places in South Pacific. Um, these plants were also uh, tested by the Hawaiians and they were found to be used to make some of the finest um, mats. The Makaloa mats are some of the finest in the world. Aohuhu, the stem of the Aohuhu was used to help them in catching small fish. Um, 
the marine algae was found to be edible. Um, they also found many medicinal plants that were helpful for them. These are all, a lot of them were indigenous, some of them were endemic. Nevertheless, they were tested by the Hawaiians and they're integrated into their culture. Makaloa um, is a, a, one of the first in indigenous plants we'll discuss. This is what it looks like, it's a wetland plant. Each stem was actually cut with a shark's tooth and um, plated into these beautiful mats. It's about the size of a full-size bed. And these were reserved for ali'i. So on top of lauhala mats in a Hawaiian house, on the very top would be a makaloa mat, and that would be an ali'i's uh, living quarter. The stem of the makaloa could be dyed and, and, and woven into the uh, plating to make these geometric designs. <coughs> these, ge these geometric designs are called pavehe designs, and they're sort of uniquely Hawaiian. You find these pavehe designs in, in kapa, Hawaiian bark cloth, also su sometimes in, in uh, tattoos. Uh, some marine algae, these are edible, used by Hawaiians. Um, Manawea was a particularly um, good tasting um, limu. Limu uh, you can still buy limu kohu today in, in the store, Tamashio Market, for example. Um, algae, this particular alga is 90% is water and sells for about $20 a pound. Most of that, most of that is, is, is in the collection and, and the soaking to get all the sand out and, and, and uh, the preparation of, of that alga, limu kohu. It also occurs where um, there's surf breaks, so it's a little difficult to, to get. Um, but it's one of the best limu or al algae to eat with, with poke, limu kobu. Um, limu kala was used in Hawaiian culture uh, in a ceremony called ho'opono pono. Ho'opono pono was, was uh, a process by which there was a conflict, with there was a conflict in the family, um, maybe, two, maybe two siblings were fighting or two family members were fighting. Ho'opono pono was used to kind of bring resolution to the conflict. At the end of the Ho'oponopono, uh, the tip of the limu kala was eaten by both parties. Kala in Hawaiian means to forgive. So this act of eating the limu kala was a sim symbolism of forgiveness of what had occurred and now we can move on. So that ceremony, Ho'oponopono, uses limu kala as, as sort of a symbol of forgiveness. Um, the term kawila is named for two species of, of hardwood trees. <coughs> yeah, it shows it going up, up and down on this one, but it's uh, nothing on the screen. <coughs> Projector tur turned off. So, um, Kawila, what I was showing up there is, is there's two species of Kawila. They're both, uh, one's endemic and found um, on Hawaii Island and Maui. The other one's indigenous, uh, found on Oahu, Kauai. So remember, endemic, only found in Hawaii, indigenous found in Hawaii and elsewhere. But the name Kawila is, is named for, is a use for these particular two species of plants. The hardwood of the Kawila, um, Actually, if you put a, a piece of wood in a bucket of water, it'll sink to the bottom. It's very dense. And it was used for weapon making, usually the cup of beaters. Um, so a very, very useful, useful plant. Any questions so far? A cup of beating for um, weapons. So there are clubs, because it's very dense, you can, it, 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 it um, used to beat people on the head, literally, um, with. Uh, used for spears, um, and copper beaters. So new is coconut, right? New is coconut. And yeah. what is banana again? Banana is my, uh, I didn't give you the Hawaiian name, I didn't want to confuse you. Mm -hmm. My is the Hawaiian name for banana. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I think the limu kala was only used in Hawaii for ho'oponopono, and I think uh, limu were used um, 
in Hawaii and elsewhere, so other parts of the Pacific. The Polynesians, I think, do use Limun, not to the, at the extent that Hawaiians do, but they still also use it in, in, uh, as a food item or as a sort of relish, and sort of side dish. Kind of thing. Here, warming back up. Other questions? So this, this section, we're just kind of going through different plants, um, endemic and indigenous, and sort of how, how they're used. And again, this is the ethnobotanical portion. <coughs> My dissertation was uh, done in North Kona, Kalikua. It's one of the few places where Kawila still exists. Uh, Kawila is, is actually now listed as an endangered plant, unfortunately. So few left. Uh, maybe about 200 uh, trees left in, in Hawaii. Again, some examples, um, clubs and then kapa beaters. These kapa beaters have um, designs um, incised in the wood, done with obsidian, rock, or uh, with shark's teeth. And these are geometric designs. Remember the name for geometric designs in the Makaloa, Pauvehe? These ge geometric designs were also embedded in, in the kapa. So if you hold a piece of kapa like tissue paper up to a light, you'll see those geometric designs embedded in the kapa. It's called watermarking. That's uniquely Hawaiian. Um, feather standards were made from um, Kawila. These are actually. Uh, Feather standards, the tall ones um, have all been around, but they're more prominent in the 1800s. Um, Olana was one of the strongest natural fibers in the world, and this is a science um, article um, from 1918. I'm sorry you can't read that too well, but the, the quote here says, special interest is attached to the Olana fiber as generally recognized as the strongest and most durable fiber in the world, science 1918. So scientists were, were Looking at the strength of, of Olona in the early 1900s, it found to be very, very strong. Um, Hawaiians knew this. You know, they, they were testing this plant well before that time. They were using it for uh, fish hooks, uh, I mean, a uh, fishing line. Um, this is what Olona looks like. It's in the uh, nettle family. Um, it's endemic. And Kalanio Pu'u's cloak and Mahiole. The reason why I, I sh show these here is for two reasons. One, is that the backside of the cloak, those fe each of those feathers are tied onto an Olona netting. So the netting on the backside of this cloak is made of Olona. Likewise, this mahiole is, is the feathers are tied to a mahiole net, and that's tied onto um, a, a structure made of ie ie, or, or roots of the ie ie um, plant. So mahiole. These belong to Kalanio Puru. In a couple weeks, we are getting these particular items back from the museum in New Zealand. Um, we haven't had them since since Cook uh, was here. Kalanapu gifted these items to Cook, and they ended up in the museum in, in New Zealand through a cooperation between Bish Museum and, and the, the museum in New Zealand. We're now getting these items back, so there'll be a, a big ceremony for this probably in a couple weeks at Bish Museum. Kalanapu's cloak and mahiole coming back to the home. Pretty exciting. But again, um, Olona made these things possible. You don't find mahiole or feather cloaks anywhere else in Polynesia. You only find it in Hawaii. And partly it's due to this plant, Olona, endemic plant only found in Hawaii. Koa is one of the most important uh, forest trees we have. Um, and the wood was used uh, to make uh, canoes, hold out, hold out canoes. So one piece um, of koa was hold out and then made into a canoe. That's different from plank canoes. Other parts of the Pacific, they, they put planks together to make their canoes. Hawaii uses one piece, one piece of wood. Um, this is a close up of what the true leaves of the koa look like. So you have a petiole and you have these true leaves. What happens uh, over time is that these true leaves eventually fall off, the petiole expands to become sickle shaped, and that's sort of what we associate um, Koa leaves to be, but the tr those really aren't um, true leaves in, in a botanical sense. They're actually phyllodes, and it's a, a adapt adaptation to drought. Here's the seeds of the of the koa, and you see some in the back of here. So these uh, sickle shaped phyllodes. 
canoes, flying the main um, outrigger canoes, which outrigger, or double hole canoes like the Hokulea and the Hawaii Loa. These, these were used for ocean navigation and maybe for deep sea fishing. Uh, these could be used for deep sea fishing and also, of course, near shore fishing as well. And maybe inter island transport was, was via outrigger canoe. The Hawaiian house was made from a variety of different woods. Um, uprights uh, would be made from Ohia Nehua. Um, the thatching poles could be made from um, Aali'i, this plant here. Um, the thatching was of the pili grass, an indigenous grass. Um, sometimes in wet areas, you can use um, halalis as thatching, like in a uh, hilo area where it gets a lot of rain, thatch houses there would be would be made of uh, lauhala, not pili. And then everything's tied together by coconut senate. Bark cloth is made from a Polynesian introduced plant called wauke. This is the these are the leaves of wauke. The long stem would be cut and um, a longitudinal cut would be made along the, the stem of that uh, wauke plant with these uh, shark's tooth implements, pulled off the wood, soaked in water, and pounded with those kawila kapa beaters. And then over time, it would get nice and flat. You might um, put a couple pieces together, make a large piece of kapa, um, be dry, sun dried, and then you could also then stamp it with various uh, geometric designs or use liners. Walke was used in making kapa, or kapa. Um, I have fish poisons in quotes because these, these plants don't really poison fish, but the ahuhu and the akia um, were used in tide pool areas. So these, this picture shows men pounding the leaves and the stems of the ahuhu or the akia plant. And then this, this um, mixture that would be put into a, a tide pool, and the small fish that normally you know, run really fast in, in that area so you can't catch it, kind of moves slower. It sort of narcotizes the plants, sort of like they're drunk. Mm -hmm. And so they're easier to catch with a scoop, pan scoop net. So it doesn't really poison the plant, it just makes it easier, uh, makes the fish move slower and easier for the fishermen to catch it. In tight pool areas. Uh, let's look at some of the medicinal plants. Uh, noni was brought uh, by the Hawaiians. Um, traditionally, noni was used only externally on, on the skin. Today, people take noni internally. Um, uh, popolo is in the tomato family. It was used also externally um, by Hawaiians. Um, the leaves of the kookopolau, an endemic plant, and of mamaki, another forest endemic plant, the leaves were dried and put into hot water and used as a tea. You can still buy Ko'oko'ola or Mamaki tea in, in the market. Um, Long's Market sells satchels of, of Mamaki tea. It's quite expensive, but um, you still find it. <coughs> and Hawaiians use this traditionally. Whenever they're taking medicine, um, what they would drink is usually either Ko'oko'ola or Mamaki tea. Um, and, and then it's some of the plants of hula. So the palafly fern is an endemic plant found in the shady forest areas. Um, Palaa is an indigenous plant found more in exposed, sunny areas. But um, both of them are used um, by hula dancers uh, because they embody um, hula goddesses like Laka. Traditionally in, um, in places where they would teach hula, there would be a, an altar dedicated to the hula uh, goddess Laka. That hula altar would be made of uh, llama wood and would have plants um, on that altar from Halapepe, Hala, Hala Ohelehua, Maile, and Ie Ie. These plants were part of the hula altar because they embody different hula goddesses. Ie Ie, for example, embodied Lauka Ie Ie and Laka. Okay. So the hula altar the plants had Kinolao associated with hula goddesses. All right, I think that might be it. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Good, and then we'll just like well, already yeah. knock out all these questions with each other, right? And that is actually all the questions. Yeah. And they also need the birds to pollinate them. A lot of birds hunt down. Yeah. 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 Yeah.